Hi, and welcome to the second iteration of the series of videos that we're calling Grasshopper Sharp or GH Sharp, because what we're doing in these videos is we're taking standard vanilla Grasshopper components, the ones that come with Grasshopper out of the box, and then we are trying to implement and mimic those functionalities with C Sharp scripting, so that we learn a little bit more of how to write our own implementations, but we also learn how to use Rhino common and how these operations that are described by vanilla, the vanilla components are actually implemented within. In this second part, I'm going to tap a little bit on more advanced topics. Uh, we're going to be working a lot of with geometry. So we're going to be doing curves and we're going to be doing surfaces. So what you're seeing here is, for example, a manual implementation of a lofting surface through a component, through um, a list of through a list of curves and then evaluating the surface to find things such as the point uh, at, at a particular UV coordinate, uh, the normal, the frame, etc. Uh, we're going to learn how to read the Rhino Common documentation, and we're going to learn how what kinds of inputs and outputs and do these the methods in Rhino Common take and how we can write how we can write them inside of these components. So um, this is going to be beginner slash medium level. Uh, but if you have any questions, the code will be on the description here. Uh, and in our GitHub repo, and uh, you can always reach out to, to the community if you have further questions about this. So let's get busy and let's start crunching down some components. Okay. The first component that we're going to uh, deserialize or reverse engineer or like try to mimic is going to be the interpolate curve component. Um, this curve basically takes a, a list of points and it takes some parameters about the curve. So the degree, it takes uh, whether if it's periodic or not, and periodic means whether if it's closed or whether if it's open. And it takes some parameters about the not information of that curve that we're not really going to, um, that we're not re really going to mimic in this particular tutorial. Um, so what you can see is that I already created a bunch of points in Rhino. I loaded them in here with, um, in Grasshopper, I set up parameters for the degree and the, peri the periodicity of the curve. And as you can see, the result of the component is this smooth curve that goes through the components, but also the length and the domain of the curve. I'm going to replicate all of these inputs and all these outputs. So I already have a C sharp scripting component that I have dropped here. I have copied all the inputs, all the outputs, and very strong reminder, remember that you need to right click on the inputs and then set them whether if you want them to be an input of the type. So for example, V is going to be 0.3D, D is going to be an integer because the degree has to be. Can the degree have a decimal part? I'm not sure it can. But so I'm going to leave it as an integer for the time being. And then Boolean is going to be bool. And then k is also going to be an integer. Now, the one thing that I need to remember is that this component takes a list of points, which means that if I left v vertices with item access, the component will not work correctly, because the component will try to create one curve with each one of the items that has been provided to it. So each one of the points that have is, has been plugged in here. So that's why we need to change the access level of the V parameter, the vertices to list so that the component works with the full list. So we can see the full list of points and then create a curve through them. All right. And then, but for the other D, P and K, we can leave those as item access. I'm going to plug that in here and here in here. And then I'm going to just um, plug in an out component. And then I think we're at this point, we're ready to start uh, writing our code here. All right. But before we do that, I would like to, um, I would like to figure out what, how can we create uh, an interpolated curve. And for that, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Rhino common documentation which is probably going to be the which is going to be the best way to find how from the Rhino geometry kernel, I can create such a curve. Um, remember, that if you go to the Rhino common documentation, 
the main namespace that you want to be using is the Rhino geometry one, which is the one that contains all the geometry goodness. And because I want to create an interpolated curve, I'm going to just search something here like curve, interpolate or something like that. Okay, and I'm going to see what comes up. I see that a lot of things come up. This is really good. And curve dot create interpolated curve kind of sounds like something that I want. So I'm going to click here. And what I see is that uh, this is the documentation page of the function that creates the interpolated curve. It is very important that we that we check these because um, Rhino Common, the Rhino Common documentation will give us a lot of information about how to use this, how to use this method, what kind of information do we need to feed in, etc, etc. So it's a very useful one. I'm going to backtrack a little. And just because I can see that the create interpolated curve method belongs to the curve class, I'm going to go to the curve class. So here, you know, and I can see that the curve class in Rhino common has a lot of stuff. So it has constructors, it has a lot of really interesting properties. So the degree of a curve, the domain of a curve, we're so going to use this for this component. It also has the point at the start, this point at the end, um, whether if the curve is periodic or not. So all of these are values that we can get from the curve. And then it has a lot of methods. It has, for example, close the, find the closest point to, to some other point, uh, whether if it contains a point or not, cre methods to create curves. And you can see that all of these ones that have the orange S, all of those are static methods. I will explain what that means in a second fillets, you can tween, you can find the curvature at some point, we will definitely use this down the road today in our in our in our in our in other components, but it has a lot a lot of goodness. So the class, the curve class is very complex, it has a lot of stuff. And it's very, very interesting. I think we have used as I can see that we have used is planar somewhere in the past. So um, so it has a lot of stuff. So taking a if you're learning C sharp in Grasshopper, it's probably worth the time sitting down and like just doing like a quick read over what is available uh, in certain classes so that you can understand what kind of things you can do with the geometry that Rhino Common provides you. I'm going to go back to um, create interpolated curve. So you can see here, I that I have three static methods. Uh, with the same name, each one of them taking different inputs. So one of them takes point 3d and an integer, another one takes point 3d integer and curve not style. And uh, this one takes blah, 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 and then two more vectors. I think the one that I want to use is this one, because it feels like it's the one that matches the inputs most closely. Because if I click here, you can see that this method in order to create a curve takes a list of points, I enumerable is an interface that means that this is a collection of point 3d objects, then it takes an integer, which is the degree of that curve. And remember nerves curves, normally are degree three, but you can go all the way from degree one, which is basically straight lines and straight segments to degree five, which is like a very smooth curve and higher and higher. It's just that the higher the degree, the more computation it takes to calculate the curve, and you don't really see much more benefit. And then the curve not styles, which, um, which specifies whether if the curve should be periodic or not. So that's going to be super useful for us here. Um, so and also one thing that I would like to note is that this method is static. What that means is that whenever I call it, I need to call it from the base class. So I cannot call it from an instance of a curve. Let me explain in this the component what this means. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to my component. And I'm going to say I'm going to create a uh, curve object, which I'm going to call C. And then what I mean by static is that in order to in order to create this curve, I need to access the create curve, the interpolated curve method from the base class from the curve class. And as you can see here, as I press dot, all the static methods show up, I have a lot of methods to create different kinds of curves. And I think the one that I want to use is this one create interpolated curve. As I 
open my parentheses, you can see that I can, I can go and navigate between the three overloads. So the three kinds of inputs that I can give it. So the list of points, the degree and the nuts, or even I can, I could work with the starting and the ending vectors, uh, which I'm not going to do right now because it's not part of what the component does. So I think I want to stick to this one where I need to pass first a list of points. So that is V, that is what's coming from the input. I need to give it the degree, which is V. That was also what's coming from the input. And then I also needed to give it the curve knot style nuts. What is this? Um, I'm not sure, I haven't done this ever, but I I'm going to say that since, uh, since, okay, I'm going to go back to the documentation. Since this input is of the type curve not style, what I'm going to think, what I'm thinking is probably this is some kind of enum that gives me, that given some numbers, make me choose, give me the possibility of choosing what kind of periodicity and how the knots are handled in this curve. So if I have no idea what that is, I can go to the documentation and you can see that here on the parameters, I can click on rhino.geometry.curve knot style, which takes, which takes me to here. So what this is, is telling me is that curve knot style is an enum that has six different potential values. All of them being whether if this is uniform, a chord, a chord square root. So those are how the knots are handled by the, the curve. And then it has the same three, but on a periodic way. So with the same knot distribution, but making the curve closed to each other. So what it looks like is that I may actually ha do have to do some pre-processing in order to find out which exactly is the, the knot that I want to use. So let me go back to Rhino and do that. I'm going to leave this not working for the moment. I'm going to copy paste here um, this value. So I think by default is two here. All right, I'm going to paste that in here. This is an integer. Okay, and if you remember the input here says that you can see that it says zero is uniform, one is chord, and two is square chord. So what I would like to do is I would basically like to implement a rule where reading at the knot style and reading on whether if the curve is periodic or not, I choose the right value here. Okay. And how am I going to do that? Basically, I'm going to say I'm going to take the value of the chord, which you can see that is the same as in grasshopper series uniform one is chord and two is chord square root. And if the curve is needs to be periodic, then I'm going to add the value of three to these numbers so that I make them turn them into these numbers. Very simple. So let me pre calculate that. So I'm going to say not style equals whatever the user is giving me as k. Okay. And if p equals equals true, if the input of periodic equals equals true, or I can simplify this by just saying this, then not style is going to be, I'm going to increment it by three units. So now that I have that, I actually need to create a not style enum. So um, curve not style, is that correct? Curve not style? Yes, curve not style. Um, style is going to be equal to not style style. Is that correct? Does that work? And then here, I'm just going to input that. Um, and then the curve is going to be the curve that I output is going to be C. These are going to be the outputs. Is this going to work? Let me check. Uh -huh. It cannot implicitly convert from integer to not style. So I need to find a way to convert this, which is an integer to the actual curve not style. Um, I think I can do that by casting this. Am I correct? I think I can do such a thing. I can just cast the integer into here. So what have I done? What I've done here is using this parenthesis in front of the value and specifying the type. What I have done is I have cast it. I have converted an integer to something of the type curve not style. Another way to go about this 
could have been curve not style and then if i use the dot notation you can see that i get a breakdown of all the options that i can fit in here the problem is that i cannot choose them by their integer value which kind of sucks so i will need to write like a very long if else if else if not style is zero then choose chord if it's if not style is one then choose blah 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 you know so it would take a little bit of time so i think this is just easier to do okay so with that, if I click here, I should have my planar curve. And if I turn this off, you can see that indeed, I get the exact same curve that I that I that I created. Now, what about length? And what about the domain? Well, that's actually very easy to do as well. So here, once that I have the curve, what I can do is I can, for example, I can say curve length is probably C which is the curve that I just calculated dot. And there's probably something that computes the length of this curve. So um, what am I, uh, what am I going to do? What am I, I need to find this. So here, get length. This is, this is a component that I open parenthesis and it has a bunch of overloads. So I can use for, I can just get the length with a very small frac tolerance. I can specify which tolerance I want for calculating the length. I can calculate the length of a subdomain, just a chunk of this curve, and I can combine those before. So I'm just going to use this, um, this method. Now you may ask, why is it a method? Why do I have to get length? And why not something similar to other, other, other scenarios where I just ask for the length property? Well, the thing with NURBS curves is that because they're mathematical entities, uh, it actually takes, depending on the nerves and the number of deg the number, the degree value, et cetera, et cetera, it actually takes some computation to, um, to figure out the length of that curve. It's not as easy as calculating the length of a vector, for example. So because it takes some CPU power to do that, uh, it's something that objects don't have as information by default, unless you ask them to give you that information. So that's why probably they chose to use a method here uh, to get the length instead of just a property. Um, so let's see if that works. So if I, if I output L equals curve length, and I run that out, uh, I can see that the length is the same. So we're good. And then the last thing that I need to do is I need to figure out the domain of the curve. Remember that the domain of a NURBS curve is the range at between which the parameter value goes. And the parameter is, um, the, the parameter you can think of it as like some form of like relative length um, uh, uh, along the curve. It's not exactly that, but um, I actually, if you wanna learn more about that, you can probably check my, my, my Harvard lecture, my introduction to computational design curves. Uh, on YouTube, and I have like some videos that explain NERVX curves quite in detail. Um, so we'll remember that the domain in Rhino common terms is called an interval. So I'm going to say that this is going to be C dot, and that's probably something, yes, gets the domain of the curve. So I'm going to take the domain, and I'm going to spit that out through D out dot D. All right, and as I do this, um, no, sorry, this is not D, it's DOM. All right, so yeah, so there we go. Now we have the component that takes a list of points, uh, degree, periodic, and the not style, and gives me all the information, it gives me the curve, and gives me all that information for that curve, okay? Uh, I think this was really useful, because it's very basic and very interesting to learn about this. Nice, let's move on to the next one. The next component we're going to do is, is actually super interesting because we're going to take the same curve that we just generated and we're going to evaluate it. Evaluate it in grasshopper terms means um, using a parameter value and then figuring out all the information that we can at that parameter value. This is a concept that we're going to explore now for curves that we will explore in this video as well, also for surfaces because evaluating geometrical entities nerves Geometry is a very interesting thing. It's, it's something that we do very often to find 
uh, properties of the curve, properties of the surface at that particular parameter. And I would like to remind you again that the parameter is a numerical value that defines where in the internal domain of that curve you are situating yourself. Again, you can think of this as not a, an Euclidean distance, but somehow a relative distance along the curve, which also can vary in density and speed. It's a, um, it's a concept that takes a little bit of time to, to grasp. But again, you can, you can check my other, you can check my, my into computational design lectures if you want to learn more about this. So what I've done here is I have placed the evaluate curve component and I have plugged it in to the curve that we just created before. And I have replicated that component with C sharp script component. And, and I would like to remind you that we need to right click on the input and set that the type needs to be of the type curve. So what is curve? Curve is here. And then T, which is going to be a number, we needs to be of the type double because the parameter can have and should have a decimal part. Okay. Now, the outputs that this component is going to give me are going to be the point, the actual point along that curve that corresponds to this parameter, then it's going to give me T, which is the tangent vector at that point. And it's going to give me also this thing called the angle because between the incoming and the outcoming curve, we're not going to do that. This component, this output, what it does is if a curve has a kink, so if the parameter sets you exactly at an angle where the curve is not continuous, then it's going to give you the angle between the two vectors that are tangent from the two ends at which this kink is, is itself. So that is, that's an operation that is a little more involved that I would like to get on right now. Um, so I'm not, I'm not going to replicate that for this, for this component. So let's, let's get started. The first thing that we need to do is we need to find the point at the parameter. And again, if I don't really know how to do that, the best way to find out is by going to the Rhino common documentation. So I'm going to go back here to curve. You see that curve has a lot of things uh, for you guys have for homework, you have to like sit down and look at the curve class and look at everything that you can do. That is going to be my homework for you today. But I know that if I try, I try to find here on the curve, on the curve class, if I can, if I try to find point at, you can see that I can get the point at the start and the point at the end, but I want to get the point at a particular parameter. So I'm going to keep looking at, and you can see that point at, evaluates the point at a curve parameter. I think this is probably what I want to do. And yes, as you can see, the point at method, which is not static, it belongs to an instance of an object. So a particular curve, given a T value that corresponds to the parameter. So this number, which is where we are inside of the domain of the curve, and then it returns a point 3D object. So it gives me an actual point object. So very simple. This is the one that we're going to use. So here I'm going to go to, and I'm going to say point 3D P is going to be on the curve. So C, the curve that I want to evaluate dot point at point at, and as an input, I'm going to give it the parameter, which is T as an input. And then the outputs are going to be here, are going to be this one. I'm going to click here, you can see that Indeed, as I do that, I'm going to turn this off. As I do that, my two points are the same. And if I if I go to do, 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 I can you can see that indeed, I have, I can find a point along that curve. Something interesting happens here, which is that if I go over a particular value, then this component goes orange, and it tells me that the parameter is outside of the curve domain, the result might be unpredictable. Uh, and which value is that? Which value do you guys think is going to be? Well, I'm going to respond right away. <laughs> the value over which the component fails is the value of 12.990. Because at that point, when I leave, when I'm outside of the domain of the curve, I'm not inside of the curve anymore. So because the curve is defined, is a nerves curve, and is defined by a polynomial, I can still interpolate in that polynomial outside of the domain, but the results are not what I may want from the curve. So we will 
in a second implement this uh, warning sign so that we can tell the user if they're doing something that is correct or is not correct. But for us, we still get the same result. So that's fine. We will get to that um, in a second, OK? Also, a quick reminder, the fact that this curve starts at the main 0 is almost a coincidence. It doesn't really necessarily, curves don't necessarily always start with the domain. They, always, they don't always go from 0 to whatever number, OK? Just a reminder. Um, now, what is the next thing that I would like to find? I would like to find the tangent at that point. So is there such a thing in the curve class? Well, probably so. I, I, was, I, I searched for tangent, and you can see that I can evaluate the unit tangent vector at a curve parameter. So similarly, there's a function that for a curve, we can pass the parameter value, and we get a vector 3D object. So very similar. Uh, very similar as well. So we can say vector 3D uh, tangent is going to be C dot tangent at parameter T. And then here, we can output that vector. If I click here, I get the same value for both. And so we're good for this. Okay. Um, as I said, I'm not going to implement the angle uh, because it's a little involved, uh, and I, I'd rather cover other things that I find more fundamental. Now, <clears throat> but I, what I would like to cover is adding this small UI notice to warn the user that is asking for a point that it's not, it's asking for a parameter that is not inside the domain of that curve. That is actually very easy to do, uh, but it also means that we're going to have to work with intervals, which I find interesting. So let's do that. What I'm going to do is before I do any operation, so before I calculate anything, I'm going to do a check. And that check is going to be whether if the value of t is inside the domain of the curve. So for that, I'm going to first take the domain of the curve. So that's going to be, can you give me the domain? All right. And then there has to be something like domain dot um, includes parameter. So you can see this, that the domain, yeah. So I'm going to create a variable called Boolean is inside domain. And this is going to be equal to domain dot in, includes parameter. So what this function gives me is it, I can give it a value and it tells me whether if that value is inside of this interval. So, and the return, is a Boolean. Is it yes or no? Um, so what I can do is I can just pass in here the value of t. Okay. And then I can make a check and I can say if is inside domain, if this equals equals false, or a shortcut for this is if not inside domain equals true, uh, whatever you fancy. Then here, I'm going to write that warning message, um, but I'm not going to stop execution of the component, as, a, as opposed to some, some, some other times when we've done in the past that, because we, want, we still can find data about it. It's just that we want to warn the user that like maybe the results are not what he will expect. So I'm going to say component dot add runtime message. The level is going to be. The level is going to be a warning and then outside domain, you know? But I'm not going to, some other times, if the error is critical, what I would have done is I would have stopped the execution of this component, but I'm not going to do this because I still want to output the information. Okay, so as I do that, you can see that now I get the error message as well. Uh, and whenever I go below, 12.90, then, then I am good. Okay. Wonderful. So I think with this, um, this can be a, I think we're good to go. So I think we're ready for the next component, which I believe I'm going to do. I'm going to take this curve and I'm going to divide it in a bunch of points. Let's do that. So let's get to it. Um, we're going to take that curve that we just created, uh, and we're going to subdivide it 
uh, into, and actually this is, this should be here. We're going to subdivide it into uh, a list of points at equal length segments. Um, all right, now what I've done is I have cleaned up a little bit of what I had before and I have created, taken the curves that we created before, I have used the divide curve component, which takes the curve, which takes how many segments do I want to divide this in? And it takes a Boolean parameter of whether if I want to split the curve at the kinks. Um, split segments at the kinks. I'm not really sure really what this does. Um, I may actually not even implement it because I don't know for reals what it does. Um, but the component, the output that it gives us is a bunch of really interesting stuff. So for example, it gives us actual points uh, along those divisions, it gives us the tangent vectors for each one of those points, and it gives us the parameter at which those points are along the curve. And um, I want to note something really interesting. For example, we're going to divide the curve in segments that are equal at length, but you can see very interestingly that the parameter, the distribution of the parameter, is doesn't correspond to the length of the curve. It corresponds to other stuff. And we can see that very clearly because if we are have divided in equal length segments, you can see that the, the length, the domain interval between for the first part is roughly 1.25. Whereas for example, the difference between these two points is not 1.25 is roughly one. And the difference between these two is roughly 1.5. So the distribution of the parameter is not constant along the length of a curve. This is a concept that we need to, um, to remember, uh, but it's fine because like we will use Rhino common to overcome all those, all those problems. So I created my C sharp script component. I mimic the inputs and the outputs, and I'm going to right click on each one of the inputs to say C must be a curve and has to be an integer and K has to be a Boolean value. And now I'm going to go in and I'm going to start typing in the code. Okay. As usual, before we start typing any code, I would like to plan what I'm going to do. And since I, I never forget, I, I, I don't have, any, I, I don't know what you guys think, but I don't have all these things in my brain. Like I always have to look things up. So getting used to reading the documentation is a really good practice. So I went ahead and I went to curve and I just, I just, I just found on the, on the page, uh, I typed divide. And then what I did is that I found that there are a bunch of methods in the curve class that divide a curve by a lot of different parameters. So I can divide as a contour, I can divide by count, by count, which divides the curve into a number of equal length segments. I think this is what I will want. Um, and I also have divide by length, which tells me which divides the curve into a specific length components. I think that's probably what's hiding under uh, here, you see, divide a curve into segments with a preset length. So if I wanted to implement this component, I would probably need that other function. But I think for this one, because I want, e I want equal length, um, and, and I want the number of segments, I think this is the ones that I'm going to need here. So, so yeah, so I'm going to click on this one, which is, um, which you can see that the method returns an array of doubles. And if I look at the documentation, it tells me that it, this, this is an array that contains all the parameters that where those points, those subdivision points are. This is really interesting because I will need that as part of my output, lowercase d. The other thing that is really interesting is that as a byproduct of this method, it also gives me an array of point 3D objects, which is what I also want as part of the output. The only thing that I need to keep in mind is that this is not the return value of the function. This is a, this is what's called, um, I forget the technical name of this, but this is something like the, um, like, like an output by reference or something like that. I, I forget if you guys can look that up and tell me. Um, but basically what this means is that I need to create first an empty variable that I have to pass to the function so that the function places in that empty variable those points that it has calculated, okay? It's a, um, it's a strange thing, but it's, this is a very useful technique when you want to have a function that returns several different 
things, not just an array of stuff or etc. etc. So let me implement this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click here. I'm going to zoom a little bit. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm going to define as as we saw before, I'm going to define a variable, which is called parameters. Um, uh, T values param params is a, is a is a research keyword in C sharp, I'm going to create a, an array, where I'm going to store my T values. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to on the curve that has been given to me, I'm going to find the divide by count method, I'm going to open parenthesis. Uh, for a segment count, I'm going to say n. So that's the number of segments that I want. And whether if it to say to, if it includes the ends or not, I think the, the component does include the ends. So I'm going to say true to this. Now the outputs, because I what I just calculated was the t values, the parameter. So I'm going to do lowercase t is going to be equal to t values. I'm going to output this. And you can see that here, my t output is already spitting out these values of where those points are along the curve, which is one of the outputs that I want. So that's good. Then but I have not yet implemented creating those points. Okay, so if you remember, as I said, this is um, an op this is a, a, a it's, it's an optional thing because we have two overloads, the one that takes the number of elements and the Boolean, which is what I just used. And the one which also takes in an array of points and returns that array of points with populated with the, the division points. So in order to do that, the first thing I need to do is I need to first create an empty array of points. And I don't have to initialize it, I don't have to put any points in there, it's just a container, it's an empty bucket. And then what I want to do here is I want to say, I want to use the out keyword. And I'm going to give this method, the empty PTS array that I just created. What this method will do is it, it will crunch its its numbers, and then it will on this empty array, it will populate it with the values that um, that I that I that I needed. So here, so if I output PTS, as part of my outputs, we can probably see that I am getting now here, I'm getting all those points that the methods had generated. Okay. Um, awesome. And um, I think the last thing we need to implement is figuring out how to find how to find what the vectors at what the tangent vectors at those points are. So that's going to be that's all I think that's going to be also pretty easy. Um, so let's get to it. I think this is going to be just as easy as writing a for loop where we go over each one of those parameter values that we already computed. And then we query, we ask the curve to give us the tangent vector at that parameter. And then we just save that, uh, we store that as a list that we output somewhere on the component. So let me create a list of vector. What's happening with my fingers today? vector 3d objects like tangents, for example, which is going to be a new list of vector 3d objects. Nice. Now the next thing I'm going to do with a for loop, I'm going to iterate over all the t values. And then uh, for each one of those, I'm going to say double t um, for example, as I, I can use lowercase t because a param, parameter is going to be uh, t values dot i, and then curve dot tangent at then parameter, and this is going to return a vector three D object. Uh, so that's going to be tangent, which I'm going to store here, and then tangents, I'm going to add that vector that I just created to the list of tangents. Um, so t tangents, and I'm going to output this and it looks like this is working. Um, so, so yeah, I think I don't didn't explain this correctly. What I did was I with a for loop, I went 
over all the t values, all the parameter values. I cherry picked each one of them, made them into a, turn it into a variable. Then to the curve, I ask for the value of the tangent at this particular parameter, which became this vector 3D. Then I then add it to the tangents list. And therefore, giving me this list of vectors. And I think this should be, yeah, I think it works. They both work well. Great. So this is done. Woohoo! So now we can subdivide a curve into equally spaced points and find a lot of information about those points. Um, I feel like the next thing we could do is do we could do something similar to this one, but instead of just points, we can find the perpendicular vectors to the perpendicular planes to that curve. How does that sound? Let's get to it. So I have I have spent some time in the back end going over um, taking the curves that we generated at the beginning and then implementing here the vanilla perpendicular frames. This component takes a number of how many segments do I want to divide the curve in and it takes a Boolean value that is called a line frames. If you can see what a line frame does is it makes them, it forces them to keep some kind of like a similar orientation among them. I am not sure right now how we could do that. Um, uh, it may it may take us more time than I would like for this component. So I'm just gonna I may not end up implementing that. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, and here I have placed the um, the C sharp mirror. So I need to change this to A. I forgot. And then as usual, I have to remember to right click here. C has to be a curve and must be an integer. And then A has to be a boolean. Okay. And we are ready to go. Now, I have done some research and I found that the curve has a, a curve has a method called get perpendicular frames, which needs an array of parameters. It needs a list of parameters. So at which points do I want to find those planes? And then it returns an array of planes. I think this method is great. So we're probably going to use this. Uh, but first, in order to use it, we need to compute those parameters. We're going to do exactly as we did before in the previous component. So you can see that uh, double uh, parameters, um, sorry, p values is going to be equal to c dot um, <clears throat> divide by count. And then this is going to be n. And this is going to be true. And this time, because I don't really need the points. What I only need is the T values. I'm not going to use the out keyword or I'm not going to create an empty array of point 3D objects just because it's going to calculate more things that I need. So I don't need that overhead here. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to create, as I said, plane, that's going to be planes. And this is going to be C dot get curve dot get perpendicular frames and I'm going to pass the list of t values. When here, when it says i enumerable, this is just that what that technically means is that an it's an that it can take anything that implements the enumerable interface. And that is, um, we're not going to get into that. But basically, long story short, what that means is that it can take anything that can be iterated through which includes arrays, but also includes lists. Okay, so that's what I enumerable basically means. So I'm going to do that. And then as I said, f is going to be the outputs. Uh, f is going to be the planes. And then t is going to be the t values. Is that correct? Um, I can see that um, I get the planes, I get uh, the parameter values. The only thing is that, as you can see, it looks like my component is by default aligning all those planes, whereas um, whereas the other one needs to specifically uh, specifically uh, you need to tell it to use to align those planes. I'm not sure exactly why that is. But you know what, I'm going to take a pause and I'm going to do some research and I'm going to get back to you. Okay. Great, I did some research and I did a quick test and my suspicions were right. 
So the difference between the difference between this component when you do not align the, the perpendicular frames and therefore you can see that this one has a different alignment than this one and this one has a different alignment than this one. The difference between not aligning them and aligning them, so now they're all aligned, is the way the component creates those perpendicular frames. Turns out that this, this method already gives you a set of planes that are, are aligned between each other. Uh, but if we don't want to align them, then basically it's just as easy as making a very similar process to what we did before, where we calculate the, um, the, the center. So we, for, we subdivide the curve in, in parameter values. We find the point. We, have the, we find the tangent vector. And then we create a plane that is centered on that origin and has that perpendicular vector. And remember that for that, the solution to a plane created from an origin and a vector has infinite solutions because that, vec that plane can be rotated any, any degrees around the perpendicular vector. And that's why it turns out that the vectors, the planes that we create, are not aligned with each other. It, it seems that this method is creating, um, is already taking into account the orientation and is trying to match all those orientations, which is nice. But I'm just going to implement what I just said just for the sake of completeness and to give another example of how things can be can be focused. Okay, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to I'm going to declare that I'm going to do some resorting. So I'm going to declare that my component needs to I need to end up calculating both an array and an array of parameter values and an array of plane values because that's what I want to output. All right, and then if the user told me that I need to align them, then I will calculate those t values and those plane values in a different way than if the user told me not to align them. And we already had the solution for alignment, which was this one. So I can paste this here. The only thing that I need to remember is that because I declared t values before, now I don't need to declare anymore. I just need to populate it with values. Actually, sorry, this is not correct. This is for alignment. So when, if we want to align them, then this is the code that we need to use. And if I run this, this works. Uh, so true, false, oh, I have, um, okay, I'm getting an error. Um, I think the error is because I haven't really filled in here. Um, anyway, so let me continue with this. And now what I'm going to do is if I don't want to align them, then it's just as easy as I need to figure out the parameter values for those divisions. I need to figure out the points at those parameter values. I need to figure out the vectors at those parameter values. And I need to create a plane that is centered on that origin point at the subdivision and with that normal equal to the tangent of the curve. So I can do that uh, very simply. I can say first, I'm going to copy this. But now I also want the points at this subdivision. So I can say out PTS. And then before that, I can create a point 3D array called PTS, just like we did before. So now I have all those points. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate over this. This is going to be equal to T values dot length. And because for each one of these parameters and each one of these points, I'm going to compute the perpendicular vector, so the, the tangent vector. So this is going to be equal to C dot uh, tangent at and T values. So T values square brackets I. So each one of the parameter values. And then I'm going to create a plane called PL, which is going to be a new plane which uses an origin and a normal. For the origin, I'm going to take the value of the points at the i location, so each one of those points. And then here, I'm going to take the normal, the tangent that I just computed. And then in planes at the position i, I'm going to store that new plane that I just created. Uh, let me see if that works. Um, still doesn't work. <laughs> uh, 
where is this? Uh, okay. Um, hold on a second. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I forgot uh, because here I declare the planes array, but I didn't say what size it has to have. I don't need this for this for get perpendicular because this method takes care of creating a new plane array and assigning it to here. But here I need to create a, an empty array of planes before I start populating it with values. So that's why I here I need to say plane and then here I need to say the length. So that's going to be t values dot length. How many elements this is going to accept? And as we do that, that should be good. And you can see now that false gives me planes that are all have the same non alignment and true are planes that all have the same alignment. They're all aligned within each other. All right. So another one, another one is done. Another one bites the dust. Ooh, another one bites the dust. Boo. <laughs> right, 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 right. And then, um, okay, so what are we doing next? Uh, we're going to do some, we're going to loft a surface along a set of course. Let's get lofting, right? Now, I created these, I created three curves in Rhino. I brought them in as, as a parameter component here in Grasshopper. And then I fed them into a native loft component that just gives me this nice, smooth nerves surface that passes through the three curves, that lofts through the three curves. We're going to try to mimic this. The only thing that I would like to say is that how this component works is that it takes something called loft options. And here you can specify things as whether if you want the uh, the the, the, the love to be close, whether if you want to adjust the seams, whether if it's a tight, whether if it's a tight um, loft, a loose loft, etc. But and then what this component does is it packs all those things that you specify, and then creates an object called loft options that then gets passed into the loft. I don't think we have that possibility in uh, C sharp scripting, we cannot create loft option component um, objects. So what I may do is I may just mimic some of these inputs here straightforward as part of the um, as just like regular inputs for this component. Um, I want to make sure that we remember that the input of curve must be a list. So because we must be able to see all the curves as a list. And that options, Whenever we get to that, we will figure out what the, what the, what this uh, what this O should be. Okay. Now let's get let's get coding. Uh, oh, you see, I forgot. I uh, this input reads list of objects, and no, I need I want this to be curved because I forgot to specify that this must be curved. This is a really really common mistake. I make this all the time. I forget uh, to specify the types. Okay. No, don't remember. That's why I've been doing this consistently for all the videos. Uh, so let's get to it. But as usual, the first thing that I would like to do is I would like to go to the documentation and figure out how can we do this. So before we were exploring the curve class, but I don't think we will be able to do that anymore. Uh, because probably if we're creating a surface, then lofting will be part of the surface class or the B rep class. So let me just write here on the general search, let me just uh, create loft. What you can see here is that loft create from loft belongs to B rep, the B rep class. And um, there's a lot of things that that this component, this is a really complex method to unpack. Uh, but long story short, the B rep class, which is the class that takes care of representing uh, a lot of surfaces combined with each other, uh, is able to create lofts as a static method. Again, static method means that instead of calling the method on an instance of a class, on an instance of a surface, an instance of a curve, we call it directly from the main class. What this will give us is it will give us a an array of B reps because there are certain situations where a loft among a list of curves will give us different surfaces, not just one. 
Um, the input that it takes is an i enumerable. Remember, I said that this is basically anything that can be iterated through, like an array or a list of curve objects. Then, as here, and I'm not inventing this. Um, this is all these things you can read them here at the, as part of the parameters. It takes a start and end point if you want to align this loft. But if you don't want, you can just say, you can use point unset to just not care about that point. Um, loft type will be an enum. And as I explained before, enums are just ways of giving names to integer values or to other values. So we can probably use an integer to specify if we want normal, loose, tight, straight, developable, whatever. And then whether if we want the, the, surf, the surface to be closed or not. And this is a true and a false thing. So these are some of the parameters that are part of the loft options. So for example, here T, whether if you want tight, normal, loose, straight, etc. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add a T parameter here, which is going to be an integer so that I can specify how tight or not I want the, the, the surface. And I'm going to also specify add a CLS input here because to specify if I want the, 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 um, the, the loft to be periodic, which is also is the same as a synonym to, to, to closed. And so this is going to be CLS. And I have already specified that this has to be a Boolean and T. I specified that it has to be an integer. Okay, so I think we're in pretty good shape. So this is going to be super easy. Once we understand what we can use and what type of inputs, I'm just, I'm actually going to copy paste this here so that we can take a look at this. Okay, it looks terrible, but the way I'm going to do this is B rep, and I'm going to call this, uh, it's going to be an array of B reps, and I'm going to call this surface. I'm going to use the static way of calling this method. So B rep dot create from loft. All right, you can and you can see that I have all this specifies all the inputs that I can I can give it. So the first one, the uh, list of curves is going to be C that's coming in from from my inputs. The start and end points I don't want to take care. I don't want to care about those here. So that's why, as per the documentation, instead of giving it an actual point, I'm going to use point three D unset. So here I'm going to specify point three D unset and then point three D unset. This is basically a way of for Rhino to be able to point unset is just like a point that doesn't really exist in a way, uh, but it's Rhino's way of, 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 of defining that a point is non-existent or is null be because they cannot be null because they're structs. But that's a different conversation that we don't want to have right now. Then for loft type, I'm going to start with normal, but then I will link that to the input at some point. And then uh, for whether if it's closed or not, I'm going to use the value of CLS, which is the input that we just uh, that we just got. And then here, uh, L is going to be the loft. Let's see if this is working correctly. So I do this, I'm going to paste here. Uh, I'm going to turn this off. And as you can see, this is already giving me um, the surface that I want. So toggle, Boolean toggle, and I can like make it you know, I can close it, I can wrap it or not with the CLS component. And but now let's explore the Boolean, uh, the, the, the loft type. The loft type is going to be an integer, remember, which uh, let me let me bring this uh, again, options loft, as we have here, it's going to be an, in, an integer, zero is normal, one is loose, two is tight, three is straight, five is uniform, just like we had it here. Okay. And um, so I'm going to plug this in here. And what I'm going to do is just simply um, before I get into this, I'm going to define a variable of the type loft type, which remember is, a, is an enum. L type is going to be equal to loft type t. What I'm doing here is I'm taking the integer. Remember the problem we had before? We couldn't really use an integer to define an enum. So what I'm using is I'm taking the integer, 
this integer value and I'm casting it to an object of the type loft type. And then C sharp takes care of figuring out if it can convert this integer to something that feels like loft type. And then I'm going to use this here. And then the loft you can see, oh, this is terrible. This should be five or six stops. So zero is normal. One is tight or something, I forget, loose. Two is tight, three is straight, four is non-existent, and five is uniform. Okay, um, so there you go. So that was pretty easy, actually. Um, the only thing, the only complicated thing was finding in the documentation, uh, create from loft and kind of breaking down exactly what this whole thing means. Um, but aside from that, it was pretty straightforward. Cool. And I think I may wrap up this video, maybe I do one or more two, one or two more um, components uh, as a bonus, but uh, I think I want to wrap up what I wanted to say today, by doing a very similar exercise to what we did before, which is, we created a curve by using some points and interpolated. And then we evaluated that curve, we found information about that curve in at, along the parameter. So I'm going to replicate the exact same concept, but in two dimensions. Here, we created a loft, which is basically a surface that went through a list of curves, very similar to a curve that goes through a list of points. And then now what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate that surface at a particular, do a particular location in the UV domain. And the UV domain of that surface is just a parameter that has two values, one in the U direction and one in the perpendicular one in the V direction. So what I've done is I have dropped here the evaluate surface component. I plugged in the loft that I created before, and then I plugged in here in the coordinates to evaluate. I plugged in a point. This point here is a Euclidean point, but what this component does for evaluation is it just takes the x, y coordinate of that point, and it uses those as the parameter in the u direction and the parameter in the v direction of the surface. So we don't really need a point in three dimensional space. What we just need is the two values for u and v packed into something. That's why it's taking a point, but it could take a vector or it could take anything that takes that literally is just a list of points, a list of numbers internally. Um, I have mimicked that in C sharp. I have plugged in here the surface that we and I'm going to right click here and I'm going to right click and say that this has to be the input type of surface. And then here UV, I'm also going to right click here and say that the input has to be a point 3D. Okay. Um, as I do that, I'm going to open my code editor. But before we do any coding, I would like to go to the surface class and take a look at what methods might be useful for me to find a point, a normal, a frame, and such and such. So, so for example, I'm going to go to, I'm going to search here for a surface, see if I can get to the surface class, uh, nerves, surface methods, and nerves surface class. So it turns out that yes, there is a lot of stuff here. Uh, this is the nerve surface class, and it gives me a lot of properties of the of that class, but it also as it also gives me a lot of methods. So I can find the closest point to that surface, I can create a curve on top of that surface, I can create surfaces from points, I can find the curvature, I can find the degree, I can find the domain, I can evaluate uh, a surface mathematics, there's a lot of things that you can do. I can use frame add. So this would probably be very useful. Um, I can get I can find the frame at a particular U and B and it gives me the plane. I can probably what is evaluate? What is this giving me? Um, <clears throat> at a here, it gives me, for example, a point at a particular given UV parameters, it gives me a point at a particular uh, location, and it gives me two vectors, which are the derivatives. So basically, that is a way of saying those are the two tangents of that um, of that of that uh, surface at that point. Uh, that could be really interesting. So that's probably what I would like to use. Um, so I think between evaluate and frame at, I'm gonna have a good time here. Uh, so let's try to do that. 
So the first thing is, for example, what is P? Um, now let's uh, let's start with something simple. Let's start with F. So F was the frame, and here we have frame at, which gives me a plane. So that's going to be simple to implement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with frame is going to be equal to surface frame at, and then uh, for the U and V. Um, oh, I'm not using this. Wait, 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 wait. I'm not using this method correctly. Let me backtrack and let me look back at the, at the method. What the method, how the method works is that it doesn't return the plane. It returns a Boolean that tells me whether if the method was successful at finding that frame or not. This is a very common pattern, but, and because you want to, because sometimes operations fail. So you want to have like some way of knowing if this operation was successful or not. Uh, I'm going to, uh, so that you can read. <laughs> here. Um, and the way it gives me the actual plane it by, is by using this syntax that we saw before, using the out keyword to reference into a plane that needs to be output by the method. So I'm going to do that plane p frame, I'm going to create it beforehand. And then what I'm going to do is here, I'm going to say, success, I'm going to say, frame successful. Uh, and and then I'm going to call the frame at uh, method of surface. As you can see here, it returns a Boolean value. The UV is going to be from the point that I just input. U is going to be the X coordinate. And from the point that I used as an input, UV V is going to be the Y coordinate. And last, I'm going to use the plane object that I just created to store the result of this computation. So I'm going to use now f equals frame. Let's see if this works. Does this work? Um, it does work. But it's giving me uh, a frame that is not exactly the one that the component is giving me. That's interesting. I am not sure why that's the case. Um, I may I may need to take a look at that down the road. Um, so but let's continue. Let's now use the evaluate method to find information about this, about this, about this, um, about this uh, method, about this surface at this UV. Oh, it's been a long morning, huh? <laughs> now, so I'm going to follow a very similar, a very similar. Uh, so evaluate is giving me a point and it's giving me an array of vectors. So I'm going to define those two uh, beforehand point 3d point and then vector 3d array derivatives and then <clears throat> boolean success um, uh, evaluate success is going to be equal to s dot evaluate frame evaluate surface and then uv dot x uv dot y, then the number of derivatives means how many, how many times do I want to perform derivatives on, on this surface. Uh, but that basically means, how can I explain this? Um, the first derivative of a curve is the is the slope of that curve. Um, and if I do a second derivative, then I'm calculating the slope of the slope, uh, and so on and so on. So long story short, I want to use the value of one here, I think. And then out is going to be point, I want to show the result of that in the point variable that I did that I described before that I de declare before. And I'm going to store the derivatives in the vector through the array that I declared before as well, derivatives here. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to run this and see if this works. I get no errors. That looks promising. So let's see the results. So P is going to be equal to that point that I calculated. And is that true? I am getting um, a different point. <laughs> uh, well, at least this point and the point of the center, they do match. Uh, so that's good. Why am I, I'm not sure why I'm not getting the same values, but uh, we'll get to that at some point. And then the derivatives, 
U and V are going to be those two directors. So U is probably going to be derivatives zero and V is going to be the derivatives one. So those are the perpendicular vectors in those two directions are uh, U and V, uh, which uh, they kind of look similar to this one. So because we're not in the exact same location for some reason, I don't know what's going on. And then what is N? N is the normal. So um, I'm not sure if there is a normal, normal at. So it does seem like it computes the normal. Um, so I think we can use that. We could also just multiply the two derivatives and do the cross product and then find the normal. That is, that is correct. But I, ne I need to double check that. Um, and then, so vector 3D normal is s dot normal at u v x u v y. And as we do that, um, n is going to be equal to normal. And we have the normal here. Um, yep. So, and that is, that is, that is what it is. Um, so I have noticed, so I think what we've done is correct, but I think there's something wrong about, uh, about how the two components, uh, find the UV space. Ha ah, okay. That was a really, okay. I found out that was a really, really simple mistake. The problem was that the two surfaces are actually slightly different just because um, in the lofting parameters are also slightly different. So if I, for example, if I go here and I say loft options and I plug in here a loft options and then I also, um, I say I use the same type for both. So for example, I use a, a normal loft then you can see that the result for both of them is actually the same one. I was just, I had like slightly different loft uh, methods and therefore uh, the surface was actually slightly different and that's why it was giving me points that were slightly off from each other. Uh, that was simple to fix. And last but not least, requested by the audience live here on the, on the stream right now, I'm going to do surface closest point. I think this should, well, this one should be pretty straightforward. Uh, and this is a component that basically takes any point in 3D space and, uh, and computes the closest, the most proximal point on the surface to this point. It gives us the point on that surface. It gives us the UV coordinates of that point on the surface. And it gives us the distance between the original point and the point that we just computed. Um, so this should be pretty easy. If we look at surface, I think uh, there is uh, closest, we should be able, yeah. So there is closest point. Um, so here you can see we have Boolean closest point, we have the test point, and it gives us the UMV parameters, which then we can use to evaluate the surface of, on that U and V parameter. So um, that should be pretty straightforward to do. Um, as you can see, I have forgotten to set the types of my inputs. So I need to right click here on P to say that this must be a point 3D, S must be a surface. And then I'm going to go here and I'm going to say, well, uh, let me look again at closest point. It was a Boolean, the return is a Boolean, whether if it found the point or not, then the test point and the out is U and V. Okay, so I'm going to define U and V as the outputs that I need to find. Then I'm going to say success is going to be equal to uh, surface dot closest point. Then the point that we want to test is P and then out is going to be U and out is going to be V. Let's see if that um, works well. So for outputs uh, and UVP, I'm going to create a new point with UV and zero. And let's see if this works. Oh, I got a problem somewhere. Um, point geometry, oh, sorry, this is point 3D. 
Yes. So here we got two very similar values to the original one. Again, I think we're having the same problem as we had before. I think there's something with the, um, the this component maybe is reparameterizing the surface. Maybe it's not. I don't know what's going on. I need to take a look at this um, somehow, but it's close enough. <laughs> um, so and then um, and then what else? P out. Well, so now we need to find the point. So I think we used to use evaluate. And this gave us the point and the directions. So that's, that's fine. So point 3d um, uh, point and vector 3d array derivatives, and then s evaluate. So u v one derivative, then point and then derivatives. And so here p out should be the point that we just calculated. Is that correct? Um, so there is something that is not working here. Oh, I forgot the out keywords here. Um, yeah, so again, the point is kind of close It's not exactly the same for whatever reason, I mean, I need to take a look at this. And then the distance is going to be super easy double d is going to be point distance to the point that was coming from the input. And then as the output here, uh, we can just do that. And because there's a slight offset here, the distance is not exactly the same either. Um, okay, so this looks, um, this looks good to me. Um, so all right, so this was surface closest point, And with this, I am wrapping up this video. We implemented a lot of uh, vanilla grasshopper components that have to do with geometry. We learned a little bit about reading from the Rhino common documentation and figuring out how to perform these operations based on the documentation. That is a very, very important thing to learn when you are writing C sharp scripting inside of grasshopper, or in general, when you're using somebody else's libraries. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here on this video, I might continue doing more series of this, if people want it, if I find components that are interesting to have a conversation around. Um, so if those videos are live, you will see links to the continuations here or like a card will pop up here somewhere pointing you to continue learning. Uh, but in the meantime, um, stay safe, stay healthy. And code a lot and send me, send me, tag me or send me stuff if you do cool stuff with this. Okay. Thanks a lot.